state reclamation policies of the hang and their transformative impact on the uh, vision of the community and the citizens of the whole. My interest in the topic first emerged following the 2011 uprising that sort of took place in the Arab Spring and um, also kind of showered the hang. Um, because not much more than a decade ago, here you had a country that implemented a lot of changes in the way that it's uh, running the country. We changed into a constitutional monarchy, and with that came a lot of hopes and promises for the people. However, since then, we've been uh, ten, less than a decade later, as you can see, uh, we're in the most unstable state that we've been in since the, our independence in the 1970s. And so I hypothesized that it was a pol policy failure uh, in providing for the people that has led to this and he chose to look at this through the lens of land reclamation policies and their effective impacts on particularly the fishermen communities because um, although it can be, uh, it's hard to kind of extrapolate the findings to the national level, uh, I argue that fishermen communities are one of the uh, identifiable communities that have been uh, populating the opposition platform since 2011 and have uh, banded together to call for reform uh, in the country and towards reprioritizing state uh, services towards the public good. And so through this research, I begin to tease out the role of the state and civil society um, in the condition, to, to see how they how they, they have created the conditions in the country today. Uh, understanding the spatial configuration of Bahrain is critical, specifically to the study. Bahrain is an island, an archipelago of around 40 different islands uh, in the Middle East. Um, located close to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and uh, the United Arab Emirates. It's, however, undergone significant physical changes since the turn of the century, particularly since the uh, discovery, of, discovery of oil in the 1930s. As you can see, from the 1950s um, to the, looking at Bahia today, the country is barely recognizable. And the transformation mainly arose from uh, in the 80s when the government implemented diversification policies. Uh, to kind of create more uh, of an economy in the country. And they reinvested public funds into the creation of the tourism, manufacturing, and finance industries. And so over the next few decades, the country's population grew 11 times in size, uh, from around a little over 100,000 to 1.3 million today. Uh, to accommodate for this growth, obviously the government has to implement policies, and it chose land reclamation as a national strategy to accommodate for housing and services. Since the second half of the uh, 20th century, the total land mass in Bahrain has increased by 13% uh, and over 90 square kilometers of seawater is reclaimed. Reclamation, however, took place very haphazardly um, and as you can see here, there was no sort of uh, evaluation process, specifically environmental evaluation for, the, uh, for these reclamation policies and that has resulted in significant biodiversity losses. Uh, the EIA, the Environmental Impact Assessment, was only developed in the early 90s, and even with that, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, even with that, um, as you can see here, uh, with a formalized process of evaluation, even reclamation projects that had a very low uh, rating, such as a D or an F, were still developed um, and constructed. Uh, so it's unsurprising that those most affected by these developments have been the fishermen communities. And as you can see here, um, these are communities that were located along the coast, uh, the northern, eastern, and western coast of the island, but have been pushed further and further inland as the country began to reclaim. Uh, meanwhile, the state continued to profits profit on these reclamation projects, and then that was really filtered to the uh, fishermen communities. So to study uh, this complex issue, I developed uh, a methodology that included archival research, industry analysis, surveys and interviews. Um, so that, those are some of the steps that I took. But um, I also wanted to measure the effects of institutional disregard on perceptions of public betrayal, conditions that could account for the recent unrest that's taken over the country. And this was really guided by my knowledge of the Bahaini state and the literature produced on planning failure, which led me to develop um, an experimental gate uh, component in order to consider the implications of these policies specifically on trust and cooperation. So over the break, I traveled to Bahrain for around a month and I conducted this research. The industry findings um, uh, correlated and corresponded to uh, the results that have been documented by environmentalists in the country for a very long time in regards
regards to marine life uh, losses. Inefficient practices have resulted in nearly a third reduction uh, in total fish products in between the years 2004 and 2012. And with that, uh, the total reported hours at sea have been uh, increasing in sharp pace. Uh, today, fish stocks in Bahrain are considered uh, outside the state biological limits and are, are in a declining stage. Specifically, traditional fishing uh, methods have been uh, very vulnerable in this process. Those, uh, these fishing methods uh, are depend on intertidal waves uh, and lands and have been severely affected by these development projects, reporting cont continuous decreases along the years in fish landings. Experts uh, that I interviewed predict that within the next couple of years, these uh, historical methods of fishing will no longer exist, and that will set generations of fishermen out of work. Um, the unfortunate thing is the government institutions refuse to acknowledge that these policies that have led to these impacts and attribute the losses to um, the overfishing practices that's occurring in the hang waters. And while that's true, overfishing is currently occurring, the uh, the ways that that has really been developed historically is um, is very is related specifically to these policies. Um, public policy reformations took place in the 1990s uh, when we had a very low fish export rate and our balance of payments was negative in one sense. So the government decided to uh, create public policy reforms to uh, increase the fish export. And with that came the 1995 rule um, to remove the fishing license cap. And the strategy was successful in that now we had a positive balance of payments in terms of fish exports, but it dramatically affected the sustainability of the industry and its workers' livelihoods. Uh, the policy was technically legally, legally revoked in 2002, but as we can see from these figures, um, there have been a lot of licenses that have been issued over and over again um, from from 2000 um, onwards. And so you can see there's a 300% increase in these licenses um, between 1996 and 2012 for fish licenses and similarly to boat license distribution. And uh, because of these license distributions, license ownership became a huge uh, issue and concern for these fishermen. Because as you can see here in the early 90, 1980s, Bahaini fishermen occupied around six times as many jobs as foreigners, averaging close to 2,000 full-time workers. Um, but the ratio has changed significantly. And in 2004, what you see is that there are nearly half, less than half as many Bahaini fishermen working uh, in these oceans. And the, the, the industry has been largely populated by foreigners. There are, however, twice as many fishermen fishing in these, in these regions, which, we, which is why we have an overfishing problem. According to those interviewed, industry knowledge and qualifications were not factored into who, who gets these licenses, and that's why imported labor uh, were employed temporarily and didn't have the appropriate skills nor the law knowledge to preserve and cultivate the trade. Um, and so you see a lot of these uh, biodiversity losses being due to inefficient practices and not necessarily uh, simply because of overfishing. Uh, unsurprisingly, these policies have led to substantial increases in um, fishermen's salaries and incomes. Uh, the resulting economic losses have compounded when taken into consideration uh, policies affecting the cost of complementary goods, such as gas. The government has um, usually subsidized uh, the, the complementary goods that are needed for fishing. However, over the years, it has retracted those subsidies and has, um, for example, continued to increase gas prices. And by 2017, gas is supposed to increase by nearly 50% um, to around 50 cents per liter, which is a considerable amount for fishermen that are already of the low socioeconomic status. In addition, Bahrain has the weakest comparative support structure for the market in the region. And so with such reductions in income, one would expect that just compensation was given to these fishermen for their losses. However, the elusive system of compensations in Bahrain did not require that these compensations be given out. Um, and so a lot of fishermen have uh, had to endure these consequences of development without uh, monetary compensation. One such example, as you can see here, is um, this is a reclamation project in the northern area. It's called El Medina Shamaria. Um, and it was a large public housing project that was, uh, and the land was reclaimed by the Ministry of Housing. 
the government said reported that the compensations were around $1,600 to $160,000 per fisherman for their losses because it destroyed thousands of um, the more traditional intertidal uh, fish traps. However, uh, fishermen that I've interviewed in the four villages around that area claim that they haven't received any compensation so far, and that, pro that reclamation project ended in 2009. So it's been quite a year. Um, the, the social impacts have also been impacted. Their last social impacts they also went into that. So as you can see here, um, fishermen said that they have to fish now for five to six days into the ocean rather than um, one or two. They're spending less time with their family. They're not able to meet um, the needs of their family monetarily. And that, that means they had to resort to moving into deeper waters. And that became an illegality issue because the boundaries uh, of our water systems have shifted um, due to maritime, maritime delimitation boundaries. Uh, uh, contracts that were signed by the Gulf states. And so Bahrain's uh, water system has actually reduced to around one-third in size um, since the 1980s. However, um, what you can see here is that uh, fishermen continue to, to go further out because they're not able to meet the needs that, uh, of their family, which is why um, a lot of them get either arrested, captured, or even shot at, um, at sea. Uh, one of the more um, impactful social impacts that I was really considering is the, um, the sort of landlocking of these communities. These are communities that really had a relationship with the water. The, um, they, they would spend a lot of their leisure time there, their families would interact with their water, and this is where the social the realm really took place. Um, they also depended on docking their boats there and kind of kept the community accountable for the safety and sort of preservation of their uh, property. However, as these villages became landlocked, as you can see here, um, they were unable to kind of use that and the social realm really had to move inwards into fragmented religious institutions and cafes. And they didn't have that much of a community bond anymore. Um, more starkly, they also had to build vertically because of gentrification effects where the land prices in nearly the lands uh, started to rise. Um, and that meant that they were not able to um, provide for the future generations as they were able to before. The, uh, that led to a lot of cries about illegality because they can see, fishermen communities can really see how um, these policies have been uh, really helping the wealthy few uh, and not necessarily the plan for the public good. So this is what you, what you see here is one of the reclamation projects. This is um, called Amwa, just in the northern part of Bahrain. And this is an example of the luxury residences and sort of the latest gated communities that have been erupting around the country in these new big lands. Um, prices in this neighborhood average around three times the median household income in Bahrain. Um, however, public housing requests have been increasing by 5%. And so there's a gap between the supply and demand of housing that's necessary for the country, um, which is why you see the great effects. Um, another reason that you can attribute to these disruptions in, um, in the country is that there's uh, a lot of outcries about who owns this land. What you can see here highlighted below are some of the parcels that are owned by uh, the royal family, and that's become a contentious issue because as you can see, and as I mentioned before, um, villages are having to condense and are uh, suffering from overcrowding crowding because of vertical development, whereas um, empty parcels sit unused because royal family members are able to hold on to that and seek, uh, seek uh, for economic rent in the future. Um, and so this is, I'm not going to go too much into this, um, but this is the experimental game component that I created. Um, it, was, it was based on a lot of literature, literature review that I've read about trust and cooperation, and I played this game with around 26 participants, and then I, um, I interviewed them afterwards to talk about why they need this why they chose to decide, or decided why. <laughs> so um, essentially it was, um, it was based on a, a subsidy program, um, and I can talk about this a little bit more in the question answer if you want, but um, they were essentially asked to decide if they would or would not cooperate with the government given certain specific terms. And what was surprising, well, these are some of the controls that I had, um, age, education, income, and range, and predisposition, predisposition to cooperative behavior. And um, none of those that controls actually seem to be relevant at the rounds so on. Because by the third round, as you can see here, um, less than 20% chose to cooperate. And all of the uh, interviews and follow-ups that were conducted in these reflected 
a history of broken promises by the state and this inability to really follow through with any of their plans. Um, and so they all decided to act in personal, um, for personal means rather than, um, you know, for the public good. Um, so some of my recommendations, they range from ma micro to macro. The first couple are ma micro recommendations that are really more about how do you counter this, um, the impacts, the pernicious impacts of our plan information. And I, my first suggestion is the creation of industry knowledges because this is something that is happening. And, with, uh, and so knowledge that the fishermen used to have about fishing schedules and catch rates and uh, which populations of fish breed where. Um, that's not as, uh, that's changed a lot over the years. And so the creation of the industry knowledge base is really important and critical um, to the preservation uh, and sustainability of the tree. And the second is emphasis on community-based organizing, which is really a way of um, trying to act and preserve the, the, the industry outside of the realm of the state because the state has obviously not provided for these fishermen. And so um, creating sort of your own um, uh, rules and regulations for uh, the trade are critical in the cultivation of the tree in the region. And finally, um, on a macro level, one of the proposals that I had to the government was the creation of a training um, and skilling center for fishermen that are trying to leave the trade but have not been able to due to financial and educational um, uh, obstacles. And this is really uh, more about removing some of the fishermen uh, from the ocean, and that's been a call that the fishermen have been making for decades now. Um, so that will kind of help ease the overfishing crisis, but also employ these fishermen in the areas that are um, up and coming in the country. And so they'll create the cycle of um, productive uh, labor. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of my presentation. Um, my question, I guess, was really about um, when we first heard about Hawaii's and about how corruption is one of the main um, obstacles that you really have to uh, talk about when, when dealing with um, with the city and planning. That was sort of what I first thought about when I was thinking about my project is because um, the state has so much power and because it's, it's a very paternal state too. We don't pay taxes. There aren't really a lot of ways of um, voting. Um, it's not very diplomatic or democratic in that sense. Um, and so I'm wondering, how do you really counteract that um, it, through planning uh, when there's so much corruption that's taking place? And how do you kind of build on the ground? Thanks. Thank you.